Wauwatosa School Board. And as is our custom, we will begin with a moment of silent reflection. Mrs. Galante, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. Mrs. Mielfeld? Here. Mrs. Randall? Here. Mr. Ray? Here. Mrs. Weber? Here. Mrs. Fee? Here. We begin our meeting with an opportunity for public comments on non-agenda items. Members of the Wauwatosa School Board value the input of students, parents, staff members, and community members. The Board's regularly scheduled meetings provide an opportunity for opinions and concerns to be expressed publicly. The Board values all comments and will respectfully consider this input in decision making. The Board requests that individuals limit their comment on each item to three minutes. Following any comment, an individual Board member may respond on the issue raised. However, it is not the intent of the public comment portion of the agenda for the Board to enter into a debate with members of the community. Because non-agenda items are not publicly posted in advance, no action will be taken on public comment regarding non-agenda items this evening. If anyone would make it, like to make a comment on an item not on tonight's agenda, please approach the microphone and state your name and address prior to making your comment. Seeing none, we will move to approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda which board members would like removed for separate action? Seeing none, may I have a motion to, pr to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Croner. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Weber. Yes. Um, this is always a difficult item for me because I see these people who have served our district so beautifully for so many years, and it's always hard to see them leave our district. The only consolation is many of them come back to do uh, uh, sub work in the district. So, I, and I hate to even mention their names because I may forget someone, but this is a wonderful list of people that we are looking at this evening. Thank you. Any other board comment? Is there any community comment on the consent agenda? Mrs. Galante, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Milfeld? Yes. Mrs. Randall? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Mrs. Weber? Yes. Mrs. Fee? Yes. That brings us to recognitions. Mr. Meyer? Wauwatosa students took part in the annual Wauwatosa Spelling Bee on January 31st at Longfellow Middle School. Finalists from the Wauwatosa School District that will be representing Wauwatosa at the regional spelling bee are Mark Salamon, first place, Whitman Middle School, Sam Frederick, third place, Whitman Middle School, Sydney Fawson, fourth place, Longfellow Middle School, Emma Tomasek, fifth place, Longfellow Middle School. Other Wauwatosa students who finished in the top ten of the competition were Abby Amstad, seventh place, Wilson Elementary School, Audrey Naiva, ninth place, Roosevelt Elementary, and Emily Rapetti, 10th place, Jefferson Elementary. The regional competition will be held February 17th at Hartford University School in Milwaukee, located on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Students from East and West High Schools and Longfellow and Whitman Middle Schools have won several Scholastic Art and Writing Regional Awards for 2010 and 11. Founded in 1923, the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards recognize student achievement in the visual arts and creative writing. East High School seniors A. Martina Ibanez and Chelsea Latham won gold keys for their photo portfolios. Seniors Shannon Robottom, Nathan Spildy, Ann Burnett, and Emily Helmers won gold keys for their art portfolios. Winning individual gold keys were Emily Helmers, Senior, Drawing, Jacob Mordian, Senior, Drawing, Chelsea Latham, Senior, Digital Photo, Nathan Spildy, Drawing, Sarah Spanier, Drawing, Sarah Armstrong, Junior, Ceramics, Zora Martin, Junior, Digital Photo, Lauren Franklin, Freshman, for Drawing, and Anna Schreiber, Freshman, for Drawing. Junior Muda won a silver key in the fashion category. Gold key winners from West High School are Sean Schumpf, Sr., two gold keys in photography, Shelby Cashian, Sr., for mixed media, Aaron Reitenauer, freshman, drawing, Aaron Pfaff, Sr., for photography, Cheyenne Green, a freshman, for drawing, Emma Juska, Sr., from fashion, Emily Hoffman, a senior, 
photography and for senior portfolio, Herschel Kissinger, a senior in printmaking, and Katie Bergeron, senior for senior portfolio. Sophomores Bria Jones and Stephanie Eberly collaborated and won a silver key in the film and animation category. Gold key winners from Longfellow Middle School are eighth graders Shayla Baylor and Lydia Schumann in the drawing <coughs> category. Eighth graders Cassie Waters and Benny Hansen are silver key winners in the category of digital art. Seventh graders Omar Ali, Ariana Varnell, and Caitlin Weber are gold key winners from Whitman Middle School in the drawing category. <coughs> the winning artwork will be on display at the Milwaukee Art Museum through the end of February. Thank you. And congratulations to each of these students and to their teachers who assist them. Mrs. Luke. Yes. I'd like to comment just real briefly on the spelling bee. This is a highlight for me each year. I really enjoy <coughs> this. And each year, these young people do outstanding jobs. And as the winner from Whitman School, Mr. Carter said at the end of the uh, spelling bee, I think we could have given that young man any word, and he would have spelled it. He just right through. And usually there's a um, this a spell off between the last two. He just won it right straight. There was no. It was just. It was so exciting to see this for these young people, fifth through eighth grade. It just. I always look forward to it. So congratulations to each one of them again. Thank you. That brings us to our action items this evening. We'll begin with student learning. Mrs. Randall. It is recommended that the school board approve the Gateway to Technology course as presented and discussed at the January 24th board meeting. And I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any board discussion <coughs> of this item? Mr. Croner. I just have <clears throat> one brief question. Um, I think this is a good program and worth going forward with, but in doing so, seems that we're reducing or eliminating the exposure of students to the more technical aspects of woodworking and shop that they were getting exposed to in the previous courses. And since we have a trade charter school, I was just wondering, are there plans in the works or a process for keeping that exposure alive for middle school students, or is that something that we're going to move away from? Currently in sixth grade, we're going to keep uh, that piece in the, in the curriculum. Um, in the seventh and eighth grade, we hope to incorporate some of those activities within clubs after school. And so we want to continue that pathway and develop that pathway into the high schools. So um, it's going to be it's going to be a set alone curriculum, but it's going to be still offered through club activities. Again, um, looking at um, robotics and other activities that we're planning on bringing in. I just, I just want to say that the, um, the basic enduring learning from Project Lead the Way are concepts that transfer, have transferability to the trades. So like things like design concepts, problem solving, you know, those are parts, those are like key parts to both of those curriculums. So um, it encompasses a lot of the same kinds of learning that you would need. Um, it's just that this is taught through um, the engineering focus, but it does not mean that it's an it does not include um, some of the traditional trade kind of concepts and skills. Um, so sixth grade will be the maintenance, but um, and at high school we'll still have some of those courses as enrollment um, drives the need. So if students are choosing it. That's fine. Thank you. I, I know I think this is a good program. I just as long as the kids have clubs and things where they can get their hands on wood and build stuff and learn to use those kinds of things, I think that would be good. Thanks. Any further board discussion? <coughs> Is there any community comment on this item? <coughs> Mrs. Galante, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Milfeld? Yes. Mrs. Randall? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Mrs. Weber? Yes. Mrs. Fee? Yes. Our next action item is in the student services area. <coughs> Mrs. Milfeld? It is recommended that the school board approve the special education open enrollment recommendation for determining space available in special education for new open enrollment students in a building to be a caseload of one to five for special education teachers and one to 15 for speech and language pathologists assigned to the building. 
as presented and discussed at the January 14th meeting. And I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Weber. Is there any board discussion? Is there any community comment on this item? Mrs. Galante, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Mealfield? Yes. Mrs. Randall? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Mrs. Weber? Yes. Mrs. Fee? Yes. Our next item is a report to the Board of st on Student Learning. I believe Mrs. Ehrenberger will be presenting on the AP Psychology Resource. Nicole Vertrano and Andy Zietlow. Um, Nicole is the AP Psych teacher at East High School and Andy is at West High School. They are the authors of the uh, resource proposal that you have in front of you this evening. Um, per the Curriculum Council uh, review cycle, this year on the cycle is AP Psychology and Elementary Social Studies. As a result of um, presentations made to Curriculum Council in the past, they had prioritized um, these two um, subject areas for this year. So Andy and Nicole have looked at resources to support their AP Psychology curriculum and made a recommendation for um, the continuance of the same author that they're using presently but with updated materials and resources and more emphasis on technology to use with um, their AP Psych students. I think um, some of the key points here, the cost of the proposal, whether it's um, an e-textbook or a, a hard copy textbook is about $100, $100 a textbook. The total cost we're kind of looking at is somewhere between $22,000 and $25,000 to update the resources for this particular course at both schools. Um, the collective pass rate on AP Psychology with um, Andy and Nicole students uh, from year to year is anywhere between 85 and 90%. So um, that's where the variance is at. So we have a very high pass rate in this particular course. Um, they have um, stressed that they would like to increase enrollment for their course, especially by tr attracting some non-traditional students that may not choose AP um, in some of the um, areas of um, attracting special ed students or English second language or um, students of color to their program. So. Um, they're here in case you have any questions about the particular resource that they're requesting to be updated. And so, board members, any questions? Anyone? Well, I have one, I guess, then. It appears that the resources being replaced are from 2005. Oftentimes when these come before us, we're talking about much older resources. Why is there the need to replace them on this sort of a schedule? Thank you. Um, well, this is our seventh year on the textbook. Um, so when you look at, you know, 2005 is the copyright. When it was written is actually, you know, years before that. So we're at seven years. Um, psychology is a, a social science, so it's based on research. Everything that Andy and I teach is based on research results. And unfortunately, we're getting to that point in the textbook where um, the most recent research just isn't there. If we look at, like, brain research, um, I looked at the first 500... Uh, references in the textbook and only 14% were from the last 10 years. And 2003 were the most recent and there were three of them out of 511. So even like, like I mentioned with brain research, I think our book just touches on like a functional MRI which are commonplace today. So there's a lot of research that has happened over the last 10 years that unfortunately our textbook doesn't address. Thank you. I think that's all. Mr. Ray? Question. Um, in looking at the uh, price quote sheet that you have provided for us, it's a little bit unclear if we're um, looking for ebook access only or if you're looking at a hard copy uh, to go along with that. Could you clarify that? I'm going to, one of the things I forgot to mention is that both um, Nicole and Andy are presently piloting the use of the iPad. As teachers, they both have one of those and are using that. And actually last spring, um, Andy was one of our piloters of the iTouches with all of his psychology students. So we have explored the ebook, which um, is a very viable option with this particular course. 
and the cost differential is the same. I mean, there's so um, once I, I believe that we'll be moving to a mobile device, and Jamie Price has given us his support that if um, we are choosing the e-book for this particular course, which both Annie and Nicole want to do, that he will support um, with the mobile devices needed to um, accommodate that. So it sounds like um, we're just approving this for you to take one path or the other, and then ultimately you'll make a final decision at some point in time down the road? Yes, I mean, initially I think that when we looked at the proposal, some of it was for e-text e and some of it was for hard copies. I think we'll, um, we are definitely, uh, the proposal that we're bringing to you is for the e-text. We would, um, I've talked with the company, they're willing to provide for us at no cost, um, like a couple hard copies for each building to have, but that we would go, um, if we had the mobile devices that Mr. Price has told us that we would have access to, we will definitely go with the e-text for this particular course. Mrs. Weber? But I, if I hear you, they, if a young person wants to do hard, cover, hard copy, they could use that, or is it going to be encouraged that they go with the uh, technology, the iPad? If the they would the e-text would be what's available to them and the mobile device. Um, we'll have a couple hard copies in the case that we have students that that is a, a choice that's better for their learning needs and they need access to that. But it will be um, we'll have minimum minimal access to that. So um, we won't be purchasing in large numbers a hard copy text. But it's still available to those. Yes. Yeah. At no cost. Mm -hmm. Mr. Croner. You're kind of linking the, the iPad pad with the electronic version, but if for some reason we weren't able to go forward with the iPads, you could still use the electronic version online. Is that correct? Or is that not a... Or, and would you choose to do so if that were... The, the, the publisher that we're... The, the, the Worth publisher that does the Myers textbook, they have two versions of their ebook as far as my research goes. One is that it's just you can either do it online at a particular server site or you can download the ebook reader and have that as part of your mobile device and then download the textbook onto an whatever the mobile di device may be, whether it's an iPad or a Zoom okay. or whatever it is. Uh, so <clears throat> we've got most of that covered. So even if that particular technology doesn't uh, come through, it, we have many, you know, numerous other options for using the ebook reader. Okay, thanks. Mrs. Randall? Well, this sounds like a good uh, opportunity to get some information about the pilot. How is the pilot going? The iPad? Yeah, uh, you know, basically the, the iPads, students don't, have them. students don't have them, it's just an uh, iPad. Okay. I've had mine for, since uh, Christmas, and okay. then Nicole had one over the weekend to take a look at. <laughs> 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 yeah. Basically what we're, what we're really trying to do here is put everything <clears throat> that our curriculum kind of has to offer in an online version. So we'll not only be using the e-books and that sort of thing, but, you know, Blackboard will be mm -hmm. the, the main source of where we do all of our instruction. I mean, obviously, we'll put all of our packets on there, all of our assessments, all of our formative and uh, summative assessments and things of that nature. We'll use that for blogging and uh, interaction with the student in addition to having them the classroom time where, you know, so that means we'll probably get much more contact, you know, right. obviously not the face-to-face, -face, but uh, clearly an increased amount of, you know, blogging and those sorts of things that will, uh, you know, hopefully make a difference in terms of our performance on the test as well and keep increasing not only numbers but uh, scores of three, fours, and fives. And then will that make, you know, getting newer resources like you were describing, how quickly <coughs> it changes for this particular subject, will that lessen the cost going forward if we go more electronic? I don't think textbooks are ever going to get any cheaper. <coughs> um, it will make it probably a lot easier, a lot quicker. Right. And uh, talking with Mr. Price, I mean, you know, this is kind of the new frontier for education. And so mm -hmm. the, the idea of the iPads or this, whatever we ten, is going to end up being the, the technology uh, that we use for the mobile device, I mean, you know, they have an effective life of about four years before they're outdated. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, ultimately I think it's, uh, you know, a little cost involved in both, either right. if we stick with the books or the the, uh, the mobile devices. But um, you know, this is kind of students are are so into using all mm -hmm. of this technology, and this is 
kind of a great opportunity because I think Mr. Price strongly believes that at some point in the near future this district, um, all students will have some sort of mobile device where mm -hmm. they will be able to interact um, on different levels with different people. And uh, so we'd like to kind of be the pilot for that to make sure that we're doing the right things and, you know, finding out what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's sort of where we're at right now okay. with uh, the iPads. You know, at, I've found a number of applications. I mean, that really what, what is what the process was right now is just say, Look for look for apps and stuff and what's out there in addition to the Blackboard things that we're using, but like what's available and we found a number of things that are available from American Psychological Association, uh, Psychology HD, just uh, great supplemental things that we really didn't have access to um, because either it was cost prohibited or uh, you know we just couldn't get it in the schools. Mm -hmm. And now we have this not only for us, but you know we can just assign those and the students go home and they get like this you know 2010 2011 research. Um, interviews, all these things that you know, we just didn't have a, a real chance to get at any point up to now. Yeah, that's that's great. This is really exciting. And We're you know, really excited. historically, like you said, textbooks have gone up in price. Yeah, they keep going up, keep going up. And technology, you know, is newer, is more expensive, but as it's used more, you know, that's been going down. So. Mr. Price said, you know, obviously the initial investment in the devices, right. but um, up and you know, then the the cost will drop, and yeah. hopefully then. Right. Uh, the more of them that we tend to buy through the district, obviously mm -hmm. better prices and things of that right. nature. So, uh. Thank you. Yep. I wanted to ask you about student success. Um, you, had, you had a percentile in here, the 85 to 95 percent pass rate. What happens for students when they're in that 15 to 5 percent who aren't doing favorably? Well, I think that the rates that you had were on the AP test. Okay. Um, so, I mean, a student may get a, you know, a one or a two on the AP test. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have a, a failing grade for us. Mm -hmm. um, so how they do on the AP test is not tied in at all with their classroom grades. You know, we certainly have encouraged, I think, since we started the course, more and more students to take the AP test. Um, all students don't, don't choose to take it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think most of them do. Um, but some don't. And I'm just going to add to that that the, a, the research that has been done, for those students that don't receive a passing grade on the AP test, students that get a one or two, that the research is really strong that those students still fare better in college than students that never had the experience in the first place. So I just want to emphasize that just the exposure to the rigor um, has a decided benefit for students in their future um, academic um, performance. And um, I know the AP is going through a lot of revisions with that rigor. You'll start to see that as we start to look at science, that that AP rigor is moving more in a direction of critical thinking and away from the what may be called skill and drill mm -hmm. to more of the more deeper thinking and critical um, learning. So we're going to see a shift in how AP um, is um, you know, currently taught as well in the future. That's a choice that College Bound is making. And I, I do just a quick add to that too. I think students that, you know, even choose not to take the AP exam, I think the way that Andy and I teach the course, I th we really believe that, that we're teaching it as a college level course. And so there are a lot of students that maybe aren't comfortable taking the AP test yet, but it's given them a taste of what a real college course is. And I think for some students it builds that confidence to let them know that they can do this. They can, you know, Maybe, you know, think of going to college after high school if, if they weren't sure about it before. Board members, anything further? Is there any community comment on this item? All right, then I assume we'll have this back at our next meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Our next item is a report, the superintendent's report. We mm -hmm. begin with uh, the Tosa School of Health Science and Technology. And while Mr. Leach and Mrs. Casey and whomever else get set up, I believe Dr. Hurdle has a comment. Tonight we have uh, the opportunity to have Mr. Leach and members of the governing board um, from the charter school at Wilson here this evening. Um, just a couple of prefacing thoughts. Mr. Leach is in his first year as principal, and I just I think he's done a tremendous job in working with both of the schools, and I think the governing board, I look at the, the evolution of the charter school over the past four years, and how it started out and how it's grown and 
where it's at today and i just continue to be impressed with the work that's been done in particular this last year in the development of new bylaws and all the work that's going to be shared this evening but i just want to before we start give a lot of credit to all of you and the work you've done to the teachers that continue to do a great job with the kids in the school um, it's it's i think just been a tremendous experience and i think it started out nobody was real sure how that was going to go and how it was going to take off and i think it's grown into something that everybody can be be awfully proud of so we'll leave it to all of you we appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight uh, thank you dr Erdl and and uh, Bolo Tosa School District Board members, we appreciate the opportunity to share our story a little bit more tonight. Uh, I sat here about six months ago and was asked the question, what is your vision of the charter school? Um, and at that moment I thought, gosh, that's really a pretty deep question. I don't know that I can answer that right now being a new incoming principal. Uh, but after talking with Jenny Keats and seeing some of the, the major groundwork and, and things that she went through as a leader of the building uh, to get this thing off the ground three years ago. And after talking with a lot of community uh, people, both uh, people who attended my former school, Underwood, as well as people who attended you know, Wilson currently and, and the charter school, as well as my own parents. I want to give them a little shout out. Uh, they're also in the community still. But everyone gave me a... <laughs> Uh, a lot of input as to what they thought the charter was and it was interesting to get those perspectives and that's helped me kind of build my collective understanding so tonight we have a little bit of a, uh, a historical perspective here for you it's not going to be very long in terms of the history because I do know that you understand the history of the organization we're talking about here but we in pretty real time have made uh, very very I think um, important strides as an organization to think about our sustainability as the focus uh, this needs to be bigger than Mike Leach. This needs to be bigger than Jenny Keats. This needs to be bigger than uh, the governing board sitting here before you. This needs to be something that our community gets around, uh, and that's why I think it's just critical that we have um, some of the different things in place structurally uh, that we've had to put in place over the past few months. So uh, with no further ado, we do have a presentation here from several different people. Uh, because I'm fairly new to the organization, I didn't think I'd want to try and retell the story here a little bit, but uh, we do have Christy Casey, our governance board president here. Um, we have uh, Tracy Petrovowski to my right here, who's our secretary for the governance board. Uh, we have our treasurer, Christy Toy. And we have uh, Lisa Hollander, who is our vice president. And we, just, we sit here before you today to try and tell a little bit about where we've been and also, uh, most importantly, where we're going. So hopefully I can answer that vision question, um, not as a, as a singular person, but as an organization um, for you tonight. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I um, will try to be brief, but I'm going to go back a little bit further than um, we had initially anticipated. Um, it started with the, the building of, of Wilson um, being closed. And there was a group of parents who got together that wanted to reopen the, the, that building as a magnet school uh, a science, with a science focus and a language focus. And um, things were up in the air and changing. Um, the school was reopened, and this group of parents had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Ertel. Um, prior to his, actually, he was hired at that time, but I don't think started until July. We met with him on May 1st, and he said that um, even back then, he was for choices for students, and that perhaps we would want to look at um, going charter, because he had experiences with charters, and um, at that time, there um, was a lot of money available to charter schools, which um, is exactly what we did. We decided to go with a charter, and we um, opened the focus up to the community. And I think with our proximity to the medical college and freight art, it was decided that the school would have a health science focus and technology. Um, and then, in after some a year of planning, we we met with the, you, the board, and we entered a five-year contract with you. We are a charter school that is considered to be an instrumentality, which is we fall under the guise of the Wauwatosa School District. And our contract also affords us the autonomy from the district's curriculum. So we've asked that, you know, we're going to teach to the same state standards, but we feel that there are different ways in which that can be accomplished. And with your support, which back then was very visionary, and um, you said, okay, we'll grant you that. 
we'll try this. Um, but in exchange for that, we have to be accountable. We have to be accountable to you and most importantly to our students. With that being said, I went back and looked and in the last three years we have had um, TSHST updates or have been in front of the board 16 times. Tonight is our 17th time. Um, so we appreciate any opportunity that we can to um, speak about our school and the exciting new things that are going on. Um, a little bit about that um, autonomy also affords us the ability to um, make some changes to the school as we see fit and as we evolve. You will see in our presentation tonight that year one is very different from year two. Year two is different from year three, and they're all different from year four. There are some similarities and some things that we carry over from year to year. Those um, are what we consider to be best practices and what's best for kids. Um, but we, we have that autonomy and flexibility to, to change as, as we see fit, more so than, um, and in, in, in a faster pace, that that could occur in a, a school district as, as large as ours. <clears throat> we'll also talk a little bit more about uh, charter schools really being a place for experiment for districts, trying new things, trying new um, best practices, and then sharing that with the rest of the, the district. Um, we started, um, and we are still in the, the Wilson building. Um, when we first started, it was a shared building, and then per our federal funding, um, we could no longer use that word. We needed to use co-facility. However, right now we are um, using one building, two schools. Um, we now will be, this leads us to our first year of operation. We opened in um, September of 2007 with 40 students, two teachers, two classrooms. We have um, a one-two cohort, that's 10 first graders, 10 second graders that first year. And then our second classroom was a three, four, five cohort. And tonight when you hear us speak about the cohorts, it's not, um, it's not a split classroom. It's not a looping situation. Um, the multi-age component is we have 10 second graders and 10 third graders in the classroom. Their curriculums, the second grade curriculum and the third grade curriculum, are not taught apart from one another, but rather together and embedded. So the second grade curriculum is being taught and the third grade curriculum is being taught. It's, it's a rather phenomenal art of teaching, but it's, it's very doable and it lends itself well for kids who might need review of the second grade curriculum and it lends itself well to you know, second graders who might need or be ready for that third grade curriculum. But it works very well. The only thing that is really um, separate is math. Um, we're finding that that needs to be separate because of the way math is taught. Um, actually, you'll hear later on that um, we are now currently teaching Singapore math. The teachers um, were looking for a math program that was perhaps a little bit more conducive to that multi-age component. And they happened upon Singapore math. I don't think that that has addressed the multi-age component for them, but it, it certainly is um, a math program that they are, are passionate about and excited about. Um, so a little bit more, um, our first year we established our governing board that consisted of parents from across the district because we um, are a school that pulls children from across the district. We wrote our vision and mission statement. Um, we created a scope and sequence. And um, we also wrote, um, started writing our bylaws. We have um, a parent who is an attorney that has graciously, well, worked with us with our initial bylaws. Um, to write them because we needed them in order to receive our 501c3 status. Um, at that time and even now, there aren't a whole lot of bylaws or examples of charter schools that are instrumentalities. Most of the charter schools that you hear about today are non-instrumentalities. Um, there's, I think, arguments for both. In, in this situation, I think that our instrumentality status um, has really contributed to our sustainability thus far as a charter school. And um, 
I'm very pleased with the, the way that our working relationship with the district has evolved over the years because it certainly makes us uh, a stronger academic choice within the Wauwatosa School District. We just threw in the, the pie charts to look kind of fancy. No, uh, we threw those in uh, to kind of give a little, just a, a snapshot of how some of the funds were spent. Uh, we have extensive files of all those things, too. We've had to inventory some of the things this year and looking at moving forward with some of our science planning. So it's helped to take a look back uh, at, at some of the ways we spent the, uh, the funds over the first three years. Okay, year two. <laughs> Uh, we expanded to 60 students. We added a third classroom, which consisted of a, an additional second, third grade um, cohort, um, and added an additional teacher as well. Um, we completed year two of our curriculum cycle. Um, since we are a multi-age um, school, it is very beneficial to have the, the two-year cycle that way. All the kids won't get hit, um, will get it, won't get hit twice. Um, we also moved our parent-teacher conferences to um, October and February. Um, we felt this beneficial as a school. Um, that way the parents could and the teachers could meet before report cards came out. That way if there was any issues with students, um, the teachers were able to address this with, with parents and students. Um, we passed our bylaws and we uh, officially received our 501c3 status, which was very important. This way we're able to fill out and um, go for grants and um, benevolence. Um, additionally, we created um, the Charter Family Network, which was a parent-driven initiative, which was a way that um, parents could get together monthly. We could disseminate information as, and also um, gather feedback from our families. All right, we quickly move into year three. <laughs> Um, in year three, we maintained um, our enrollment um, at 60 students, uh, three teachers, three classrooms. Um, at, at this point, um, our grant monies were spent, and so this was a sustainability year where we had, had um, spent our money wisely knowing that we would be going into this year and, 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 and um, had the materials ready um, so that we knew that we could um, sustain ourselves through this year. Um, and then started participating in a strategic planning with um, Dr. Marty uh, through the school district um, to kind of help us now, uh, now start to really look at where we were headed. Um, we, we created the school, we kind of had an idea, but where were we really heading? And uh, he helped us to, um, one, um, write our school beliefs and then also refine the mission and vision statement that we had originally written um, to really fit the way the teachers were teaching rather than how it was just we wrote a mission statement this is the way we're going to we're going to run our school it really became okay the teachers are teaching this way now we need to change our mission statement and show that really this is what's working both for the teachers and for the families attending the school um, and so this created um, uh, also, the expansion and um, growth opportunity was created, which is a seven-year plan within the um, Wilson Building. We will be staying in the Wilson Building. It w you know, we were having issues on growth. Could we grow? Um, and a plan was uh, was put forth and um, talked about uh, last year with <laughs> with you. Um, and it's about a seven-year plan to to grow our school and, and to work with Wilson as a, you know two schools, one building, so that we could coexist. Um, we also um, had an uh, um, addition to our contract to add senior kindergarten, because we felt that um, bringing in the students even younger was, was a, a good way to kind of bring them into the, to our system. And we also presented our three-year review to you. So that was an exciting time. I'm sure you all remember. <laughs> Um, what was really exciting um, in year three was we did receive um, nominations for both um, Wisconsin Charter School Teacher of the Year and Charter School Person of the Year. So re receiving those nominations was pretty excited and we went to the gala and, and really got to meet with other charter schools and see just how wonderful it is to, to have the charter school, ex charter school experience. And then as uh, um, Mrs. Casey um, 
alluded to earlier was the adoption of Sinkhor mathematics. The, the teachers didn't just jump on this out of the blue. They, they went to another school, watched the practices, um, and really saw how it was working with the students and really wanted to, to try this um, method of, of mathematic teaching, presented it to the board, and we approved it. Um, and it was decided that it, would, it wouldn't start past second grade level just because it's a, a math program that really starts at the younger ages and moves up. So we started it in the SK through second grade levels. And now we're in year four. Um, I had the privilege of coming on board in year four, and uh, I appreciate the histor historical perspective you just provided us, because every time I hear it, I learn something new. But um, the reality here is in year four, we're currently at 65 students. Uh, we have three teachers, three classrooms, in three different multi-age uh, environments, SK1, 2, 3, and 4, 5. Uh, we completed the strategic planning process with Dr. Marty. We started it last year in May, and uh, I was actually glad that we hadn't completed it um, without myself present, just because, not because I'm, uh, you know, all about the control, but because it's really important that I understand what, you know, where we were and where we want to go with things. So um, we completed the, the strategic planning process in October, and um, I gave you, there's a board development plan packet that actually was the, the majority of the fruits of, the, of that uh, labor there because we really had a need for a lot of uh, clarity being provided to the organization. We needed to define our officer roles. We needed to define uh, committee structures. And the strategic plan actually allowed us to define those committees and start to get some of the work started. However, much like our school district long range plan, um, the work has to be done in committee teams and, and it's ongoing. It's not just something we can set into place and, and um, it's, it's all done and we're just living up to it. It's something that's going to be evolving over the next um, years to come should we get an extension on our contract. Um, and let's see, oh, those were also, not only was it off, the, the feedback from our parent surveys also drove some of those conversations as well. One of the unique things we have to do for accountability purposes, as you know, is um, solicit responses from our community directly, from parents. And we have a very successful approval rating of about 96% over the, over the existence of the school, uh, which gives us a lot of active feedback to use in our planning and future conversations as well. In our, this current year, uh, in October, we also had the benefit again of having nominations for Charter School of the Year, Teacher of the Year, and Governance Member of the Year. So those are all positive things for the community that, that are recognizing the hard work and commitments of the people within our organization. Uh, presently, we have created a governance development plan. Uh, we formed the committee structures, as I mentioned, uh, and I'll talk a little bit specifically about those in the next slide. We rewrote our bylaws to incorporate membership. This is a pretty critical thing. Uh, we anticipated that this, um, when we looked at our bylaws, we thought uh, we really should reflect you know, our organization as, as a membership organization. We were originally uh, cast as an organization with no members in our Articles of Incorporation, which means we named our board and the board functioned itself and uh, had a lot of things with regard to, um, I don't know where I'm going with that, but in, 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 the, in the end we had to rewrite our bylaws and our bylaws currently reflect the fact that our, our, each family has a weight of one membership, so they vote then for um, the upcoming uh, officer positions for the, for the next uh, term. And so we are currently in the process of um, adding two uh, council positions. We have elections that are up and coming uh, in this next month, so we're naming the people who are on the nominations for that. And it's pretty exciting times because I think it's, it's right now about evolving and growing our board to become more effective. Uh, at, not that it hasn't been effective, but become more effective uh, towards our future goals. Uh, we developed a budget. Uh, we created a financial road map of sorts just for temporary purposes. Um, the document I gave out when I first came in here tonight um, is just a, an example of the start of that financial planning document. Uh, but really it looks at um, our existence. We need to develop community partnerships. We need to get some sort of benevolent factors, whether it's contributions on donation or uh, people who are willing to sponsor with small businesses. And we have to have grants uh, that can somehow also help out to, to supplement everything that's above and beyond what the district already contributes. Because our uniqueness is that we get the basic allocation as every other school and then anything above and beyond that we are responsible for providing for, uh, for our students and staff. So the financial planning sheet I, I had given you hopefully can, can um, 
answer some initial questions you may have about our uh, financial, immediate financial future. Yes? About developing a budget. I know some people in the past had questioned why we never had a budget. Um, and I think it's important to realize that we had federal grant monies and we really didn't need to have our own budget until now. And so it's been um, a really beneficial thing as a community um, to create that. And so thank you very much to Mrs. Toy, who's our, um, our treasurer. So. We, we did a really good job of spending down the federal grant money. Um, it's, it, right now it's about, though, figuring out where you're going to be going in, in the future and being able to create some um, avenues to do that through a, through a budget process. Um, we also are continually refining our curriculum to specify units. Right now we had a so scope and sequence, and we know what we're teaching and when we're teaching it, and some of the how is worked out, but we really want to get that specifically down to some unit plans at this point. Um, and we've also established buy-in from our community and a commitment to a possibility of STEM, uh, which would be adding an engineering component to our current health science and technology. So we'd be becoming, uh, we'd be becoming a STEM school, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What we discovered in looking at that unit breakdown and our refining of our curriculum is that we have a lot of things we already do that are engineering-esque. They're, they're, they're sort of in the realm of engineering, and many of them are directly in the realm. For example, we had uh, some, some race car activities we did in recent weeks that were related to engineering and figuring out speed and rate and ramps and degrees and friction and all those sorts of good terms and things that come up with, with regard to engineering. So that kind of got us really thinking, wow, the STEM thing might be worth looking into, um, and that's where we <coughs> will go with some more of our conversations. When we, um, in our strategic planning, one thing that became evident to us is that um, although we started with the opportunity to perhaps do some partnerships with the Medical College and Freight Art, we have come to realize that we're, we're much more than just health science. We teach a rather large, encompassing science curriculum that is, is way more than just health science. So we created uh, an organizational structure that I talked to a little bit before uh, about that that's the colored diagram of all the neat circles uh, that was developed by our council and, and uh, created by a parent who's got a nice visual representation in her mind. Um, we have a resource and marketing committee that is really examining the possibilities within the community of trying to find ways to fund our organization and how to market our organization to the many different audiences that we determine. Uh, we have a lot of different audiences from students ranging to commu from community to students. Uh, we have a curriculum and innovation committee, which is just that. We're looking at curriculum and trying to find the ways to be on the next um, edge of, of the educational frontier. So we're hoping we can continue to drive some of the instructional things we've been doing by um, that committee looking at, at uh, the, the reasons behind why we'd adopt certain things in our curriculum. We are also actually looking to merge that committee with um, some input from the district's curriculum council because that has been such a highly effective group in, in getting things spelled out and clear and articulated that we really would hope to use their expertise in a consultation form. Uh, they wouldn't be making recommendations to our governance board, but we've spoken about that because of the impact that you can have you can really get good feedback when someone without a perspective uh, who hasn't been in all the meetings could actually see if all the things you're doing are, are actually good for the students you're trying to do it for. Uh, the executive committee functions with agenda development and kind of developing the things around uh, what our board, meet, board meets about monthly. And governance development is ongoing. Uh, it's my job as a building principal to try and help our governance board to grow and become aware of, of um, what they can do for our organization. Um, I don't control the board, but we, we grow together, uh, much like a school board with a superintendent. You know, we, it's about finding out um, who you are as an organization and then teaching the people around you and helping them to understand their role. Um, and, and the bottom line is student achievement, uh, better student achievement. So our budget. Uh, we developed an annual budget. We didn't really necessarily have an annual budget, as Ms. Petropowski said. Uh, before, we spent down a lot of funds, but that's not really a budget. And so we created a budget. Um, I gave you an initial of what it just looked like in your initial board report. However, I handed you the most recent budget. Um, it's a separate piece um, that I gave out right before the board meeting here that uh, spoke to our current state. Um, we have created fundraising ideas. We have a lot of things that are in the works, but we're hoping that we can get basically a calendar of events that we have for a, any given school year that would have both passive 
and some ongoing uh, fundraisers. Passive would be, you know, Noodles Nights and uh, Pizzeria Piccola Nights, which we do a very nice job of, and they, they taste good. Uh, but those those events are great, but it's really considered some kind of small time in terms of some, some of the monies we, we do need. But they do help. Every little penny helps. Uh, we have also contacted some local businesses. We will be continuing to do this in an annual cycle uh, with letters and meetings in person to develop those, those relationships. Um, the Wauwatosa Village is right next door, so I think it's really a worthy cause for us to look there. And also beyond the Wauwatosa Village, because we do have students that are from the west side of town. There's a lot of uh, businesses and things that are on that side of town as well. So it's important we look at Wauwatosa as a whole in terms of access to any options for businesses that we could potentially contact. Um, we have created a fundraising subcommittee as a subcommittee of our marketing and resource committee, and they are specifically looking with one focus at how to bring in uh, capital to our organization. Uh, we have a grant committee that's also been formed off of our resource and marketing committee. The grant committee is hoping to... Uh, to continually write grants all the time. There are lots and lots of grants out there, uh, many of them, um, ironically, in the field of STEM. Uh, and, and right now, education, that STEM is really a, a big you know, a big buzzword. But really, it's got a lot of, of uh, purchase power behind it. It definitely has some potential dollars in it. Um, we are, we've written three grants. We wrote a target grant for field trips. Um, unfortunately, we did not receive that. Uh, you can actually probably go to the next slide. Um, we wrote a Roundies grant for capital, about $9,000. We have not heard back on that yet. We submitted that in late November, early December. Uh, the Intel grant is, is uh, being wrapped up and sent in. It's for five to $9,000 um, of capital funds, and that's for Intel, uh, the organization, the, the comp corporation Intel. Harley-Davidson, the local connection, we're hoping to uh, apply in March. There's a spring application window. And uh, that could be another capital grant for us that is actually going to be in the works. Mrs. Hollander has been great about uh, kind of canvassing the Internet and seeing what's out there in terms of resources. Uh, Mrs. Petrobowski as well. As well as countless parents who aren't presenting because it's, we're always kind of ear to the ground to try and see what's out there in terms of grants. Uh, and many of them, um, almost all of them, if I might point out, it's because of our 501c3 status that we're even able to be eligible to apply for those. So we appreciate the fact that we have that 501c3 status. Our goal is to have one to two grants constantly in, uh, in cycle because we want to, con we want to have that next, <laughs> that next paycheck, that next ability to pay for something that we've got uh, planned. Um, in regards to our budget, um, the charter school has always historically you know, touted as that we would not cost the district any extra money. And I'd like to kind of pat ourselves on the back and the fact that, that we, we've kept to that part of the deal. Um, we, we totally understand that anything above our per pupil money that we receive, anything that we want above that is, above and beyond that is our responsibility. And we have parents who are, are committed to, to being on board, to, to finding creative ways to, to fund money. Um, to comb through all of the astronomical amounts of grants that are out there. Um, and, and I think one of the challenges that we've had and that has certainly become evident over the years is um, kind of as our money ran out, the economy took a little turn in a different direction. So that's been more challenging. But it certainly hasn't deterred us. We're just um, working harder. Um, another uh, little bit of a roadblock that I think we've run into as, as a school organization trying to, to go after funds is that um, we really are in a, in a community. Uh, we're, what I'm trying to say is we're really in the, kind of the wrong zip code. We, we don't have um, you know enough students who um, maybe people feel that, you know, are in need. But we, we certainly um, keep looking and keep looking for ways in which um, we can do what we need to do to do what's best for kids. Um, and I think we had some really smart spending with our, our initial federal funds by the, the, the staff to, to get us to where we are, where we can really function and, and be sustainable. Uh, we are in the right zip code, though, for Marquette University. Um, so what's nice, actually, I don't think we share a zip code with them, but that's okay. Um, 
But one of the things I also talked about was the idea of uh, developing partnerships. And so while we have uh, started to really try and look at the grant end of things and develop a budget with some ideas for fundraising for the whole benevolence factor, the partnerships is probably where we've had the most success. Um, this school year we've started to look at what are some different organizations around our area that maybe we want to start to try and reach out to. One of them naturally initially was the Medical College and Freighter. We will continue to pursue that relationship because I do think it's a productive potential. Um, however, we did have a successful land. We got one. Um, and it always starts with one, and I think it's going to go in, in many other directions from this. But uh, we did land a partnership with Marquette University Engineering, and uh, it really was a very extensive process. It took months to do. Actually, it didn't. It took a couple of meetings with Dr. Jensen. Uh, Dr. John Jensen, who has actually agreed to become uh, one of our governance council members and is a community member of Wauwatosa, has agreed to help us out with uh, a partnership. His department uh, that he is... Uh, associated with at Marquette University Engineering um, has agreed to provide us with a free lab for visits in the fall. They have a new state-of-the-art building that's opening up in August of 2011, which would just have us have to pay for the students getting down to the facility. And then, um, as he put it, we can bend and break stuff. Um, but the idea here is the students can discover engineering real-time in a, in a university-level lab, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have workshops for our students that are ongoing throughout the year that uh, Jack Samuelson, uh, a consultant who works with Marquette University, as well as a STEM consultant in the area, and also a community member in Wauwatosa. The connections are endless here. It, with engineering, you think you say engineering in Wauwatosa and people come out of the woodwork. There's a lot of engineering uh, focus in our community. I had no idea. And so Jack Samuelson um, puts on a lot of workshops for students and also for teachers. Uh, Jack is a former teacher in the area and has retired. It's great how in retirement he's probably working just as hard as he did when he taught. But uh, Jack has agreed to provide us with um, some different opportunities around the, the community with regard to engineering. Um, we're hosting an engineering community night on Thursday this week, and we're also uh, hosting a family night in April or May. We haven't really nailed down a date yet. But that's the kind of thing that um, Mr. Samuelson helps us to do. They also have a traveling road show uh, of student teachers from students that, are, that could be teachers from within the department. The idea there is we have students who are giving back to the community. We're hoping we can maybe even get a few Wauwatosa graduates to come back from Marquette University to teach the students uh, within our buildings. And so they would come to our location at the charter and, um, and host and hold and help with some different activities around engineering. Um, EIE is on here. Engineering is elementary. That is the abbreviation, the acronym. We're going to throw one more at you. Um, that's engineering is elementary is probably one of the, the best known engineering um, elementary level curricula that, that are out there. Um, there are a number that are out there, but right now that's the one that's got the nice local ties uh, with regard to staff development. It's very expensive, a lot of these programs, to send people around to them. Instead, we'd like to have them come to us because of the, the cost savings there. And Jack um, actually happens to, to be a person who's trained in EIE. And that was just a connection that was made in talking with Dr. Jensen as we initially met. And uh, Dr. Jensen, I think, was able to make it out tonight. The back there. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Jensen, for coming out. Um, STEM, what is this STEM thing? Um, Hopefully you've had a chance since you got your board report a couple of days ago to, to just Google, which is you know, now a verb in the dictionary. Uh, you have a chance to look up STEM and what it means. But the idea here is that we develop our science curriculum that we currently have. And we, we do some things to um, enhance those components that are maybe engineering based. And we add some where we may find some gaps within the, the curriculum. It's project-based learning at its, at its finest for elementary kids. Uh, what's exciting is, at the same time, I understand right now our school district is moving to a middle school approach that may consider using um, some project-based learning and project lead the way, uh, which is synonymous with STEM. Um, elementary STEM is, is really, uh, we would be on the cutting edge of this in the community. There's one other school around right now, Waukesha STEM Academy, uh, or STEM school that is uh, new to the STEM idea. We would be the second one that I know of around here, um, although I think we're the first in my heart. Um, and so it's exciting that we get to be with, uh, on, on the edge of this whole science, technology, engineering, math focus. We also have conversations along those same lines of developing a first Lego league. Um, so this is a competitive uh, Lego competition that 
Um, some schools have clubs in the area, and we would start a club and then hopefully grow that into our regular practice in the classroom. Um, I can tell you lots of dads have come out when we've mentioned this one. Many of the fathers have said, oh, I have Legos. My kids get to use them. Uh, and so it's really it, it's a great way to reach out to families and community members to try and involve them with some engineering uh, focus. We also have uh, developed a focus with Singapore Math, which is a different curricula than we, program that we currently use with everyday mathematics. Um, I would argue that we probably use the um, whatever works mathematics right now in the charter because we are in transition. We do teach everyday mathematics to some of our students. We do teach Singapore math to some of our students. And we teach both to a lot of our students. So right now it's really uh, whatever works method, uh, but it's been neat to see the growth of students uh, and it'll be it will be neat to track the growth of students in Singapore math over coming years and just being able to use some of that, some of that data. Uh, we also are trying to drive technology in our school. Right now we're currently working on three-year-old laptops. Um, that's ancient in technology terms. However, we do have plans in place um, as funds would become available. We have basically a per cost of about $400 a unit for hopefully tablets. We'll work with Jamie Price to see about the best um, cost for those. But the idea here is we have teachers and kids who are not afraid of that and really are requiring that now that they've been using that for the past three years. It's pretty neat to see if you ever have a chance to come out and see the kids troubleshoot their computer. It's pretty cool. Um, all of this doesn't matter if we're not having student success. It's out the window. We can tell you all the things we want to tell you, smoke and mirrors, we can answer any questions, but if we don't have students achieving, it's, it's, well, it says it in our con initial contract. We won't exist. Um, we have had some success on the WKCE. Um, we received 100% proficiency in, in uh, the categories tested last year in our grade levels, all of our grade levels, which is exciting. Um, it's hard for goal setting because, you know, 100%, okay, well, we'll hit 100% this year. Uh, but it has helped to have some conversations about maybe what is working well within the charter um, and it's, it's just been, it's been a healthy thing to, to talk through with staff. Uh, map test results, I gave you um, a comparative map test result. It's, it's two years um, worth of data. The current year is not in that map set because we're not completed with the testing yet. So we don't have any comparative data from fall to spring. But as you can see, um, in the end, it's about 50-50 that the district would outperform uh, students that are meeting their growth goals. The goal we have as a district is 80% of our students would achieve their end of the year growth, targeted growth um, in MAPS. And we are continually, as, as a building, both schools, working towards that number. What's exciting is that number is becoming a reality and is happening in many of our classrooms across the district and in the charter. Um, I have an expectation in the building, and our staff does too, um, as does Dr. Ertl, uh, that, that we're continuously improving. And what's exciting about that is that I think in many, in many cases we are. So um, one little, little asterisk that's kind of cool to, to think about is within this success, uh, it's good for the community. There's connections with Marquette. There are connections within uh, Teacher of the Year, you know, nominations, Charter School of the Year nominations. This is positive press for Wauwatosa community. And one of the results, if you're familiar with School Digger, it sounds like a very official... Uh, website, but schooldigger.com, which actually is related to any of the searches you would do on the internet for real estate, um, we has us listed, Wauwatosa um, TSHST, as the number one elementary school in the state of Wisconsin. Um, that's powerful. Now, you and I know that some of that might be because of our size, and some of that might be because of, you know, the phenomenal parents and teachers and community we have here, but the reality is that people that are looking for homes in the area, that's linked directly to real estate sales websites. So you can click on that, find the top 10 schools in, in the area, um, and it's what a great thing to have us, what a positive press piece. Even if it is a small piece of Wauwatosa, it's a piece of Wauwatosa nonetheless, which is pretty exciting. And um, Great Schools website also has us listed as a top 10 school as well. Um, expansion plans. Our work is never done. Um, Dr. Odo handed me the expansion plan the first day on the job and said, uh, we've proposed this and then I, we're going to do it. And so I said, thank you for the challenge with a big smile on my face. And we've, we've dealt with um, just the, the fact that it's a positive that we are expanding. We have an interest uh, of people to continually enroll in the, in the charter school. We have family registration day we held in January. We had about 20 families come out. We did some on-site tours for both 
regular Wilson and for the charter school, which was exciting because it promotes our building. It doesn't, in our district, it doesn't necessarily promote one of the schools over the other. It's just information to our community. And people definitely shop right now in our community. Uh, whether it's private parochial or public or charter or whatever, people are very, very much aware of the environment they're sending their kids to every day. Uh, we have a community event in February that we're holding. We have uh, town, we held town hall meetings at every elementary site over the past two weeks. We went in the library media centers. We were nice enough, the schools were nice enough to welcome us. And we had uh, some very intimate conversations with, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations. And we had some small groups. Uh, but the good news is that we had a number of families that have enrolled from that. Currently, as of uh, Friday, we have 24 students who have applied to the charter school. And that is given the fact that we have 10 available seats right now, um, almost all of which are at kindergarten. And we have a number of sibling families who have not put in their paperwork yet because they need to get their paperwork in. And so we're any in the crowd? And so we're hoping that people will get their, their submissions in for the application process. It should be noted, though, that we don't have any fourth and fifth grade seats available right now as we have 28 students projected for next year. However, we still have two people who, on a wing and a prayer, are hoping to get in fourth grade uh, because they see the value for their fourth and fifth graders potentially. Um, and we have a number of families who have declined to apply because they know that there's not space necessarily in fourth and fifth grade currently with three classrooms the way that they're laid out. But these are all good things and that people are interested in sticking around our school district and um, trying out some of the options we have here. We do plan on having a new family orientation in the summer, which is critical that families understand what they're getting into in terms of the commitment that we have as a charter to the school district and, and what it takes to run a charter school. Uh, we have board development over July and August. I'm sure that these people, good people sitting around me are very excited about that. In the hot summer, we're planning on meeting uh, and just growing our knowledge collectively about how we're going to move this thing forward. Um, and we have a professional development plan that we are in process right now in developing, which entails uh, currently working with Marquette University uh, whenever possible, as well as with some other professional development uh, things as they may arise. We just sent our teachers to um, the National uh, Reading Recovery Conference, and they made some great connections with some teachers there. So we're hoping we can continue those conversations as well this summer. And our room layout plans, uh, that's going to be a good one. We'll see what they look like and where we go and what floors we're on, and we'll work very closely with Dr. Ertl to make sure that those um, accommodations meet our students' needs across both schools. It's critical that we, um, we do this with uh, respect of the Wilson, Greater Wilson community because we are, you know, a co-facility and it's been really great and I'll talk a little bit about the culture and the building um, as I would gauge it as of today, a little bit later in the presentation. Oh, next. Wow, look at that. A little segue for myself. Um, we're one building in two schools. This year, I had, again, coming in as, a, as an outsider, uh, I recognized one thing. Everyone in the building wants kids to be successful. And so uh, parents, kids, staff, they, they're all on board. It's just a matter of getting their energy collectively together and having some critical conversations, some tough conversations about, you know, what is the charter? Um, how did the charter come to be? What is Wilson? W what are we about here at Wilson? And we de we, we've developed belief statements and mission statements for all, uh, for the beehive. Um, Again, that would make me the queen bee, but the beehive, uh, we've made, we've had some tough conversations and, and, and had belief conversations about, with Wilson School and with um, TSHST. And so we have the PBIS thing across all environments, which is, has really helped with consistency. And it's really been positive because it's kind of common language, common expectations about behavior for students and for staff who are across the building. We've developed some joint events. Um, which we also have created a document for both, that, that both schools do. Uh, it's, it's critical that we share in our existence. Uh, we have assemblies, concerts, those are kind of the staples that are done together. But then we have staff softball game against fifth grade that we're looking forward to um, competitively operating with our fifth graders this year um, and probably beating them, but that's beside the point. Uh, we're looking to play them in a softball game. And the positive community events that are together showing that we are both existing in, in one space. Um, I have, the district has, everyone has, an expectation of collaboration in the building. We've had some teachers who have gone into charter classrooms and 
um, experience what they do for intervention blocks or what they do for, for instruction in their classrooms. We've had charter teachers ask classroom teachers about things they're doing with students that have been successful. It's been very positive. Wauwatosa Wednesdays are an effective use of our time for sure. Uh, building leadership team this year is developed across the building. We're doing a focus on writing. Um, and it's been very positive across both schools because it's just about developing consistent expectations and consistency across writing in our, in our uh, district. We've also developed a school uh, building and mission and beliefs, as I spoke to before. And it's really critical that we understand that our coexistence is the key for future success. As the charter increases in size, as Wilson may decrease in size, it really becomes critical that we understand how that affects our everyday environment. Because in the end, culture trumps structure every time. So what's next? It never stops. Um, we're going to continue the culture work. We're going to continue to promote and try and establish financial benevolence and relationships with, with um, the ability for us to make, make a little bit of money and have our budget uh, successful. We want to follow up on our expansion plans. Um, our long-range plan, strategic plan, has us looking to establish curricular clarity. We'll hopefully plan on using the curriculum council of the school district as a consultation firm. Um, we appreciate that. We are going to continually seek out relationships and partnerships similar to the Marquette University partnership. Um, we're looking forward to capitalizing on that partnership in the, in the near future. We will develop engineering across our, our charter uh, curriculum. It's just critical that we start to look at what that might look like to our students in the fall. We will also incorporate the world language program. Um, and so I think it's critical that we find a way to, you know, make all those pieces, all these pieces we provide for students um, as successful as possible. And one of the exciting things that actually I'm partaking in tomorrow is our social studies conversation. And uh, we want to really expand success across buildings. Principals, my colleagues, have asked me, hey, you know, if it's good for the charter, why can't it be good for my school? Well, I totally agree with that. And we'd love to expand our abilities as a charter to try things and then, help drive some of the things that go on in the school district. That's kind of the intent uh, of, of what a charter would be. And so that's a fair question, absolutely. And TCI, uh, the TCI pilot, we, we actually were piloting and then we purchased as a charter school, is a social studies alive curriculum that is one that we're considering uh, for possibility for future use. And um, sorry if I wasn't supposed to say that, Mrs. Ehrenberger. But, um, we, one of our teachers is currently using that. Actually, all of our teachers are currently using that. And so why go see some other district somewhere try it when we have it in our own backyard? And so it's a really great example of a potential for some collaboration within our building that would have an effect on the greater Wauwatosa School District. So um, as I said, you know, once you're done, you've just begun. We're, we're Obviously, this thing has changed over the last four years, and I just am really pleased to see the work we've done. And... Um, would definitely invite any questions at this time. Board members? Anyone like to start? <laughs> After all of that? Well, Mrs. Randall? I, I would just like to start with um, time frames. Um, tonight we're looking at a proposal to approve the next contract. Uh, yes. Okay, and, and it looks like on page 10, um, that would commence July 1st, 2012? Yes. Okay. We did this uh, in advance, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Earl, just so that we knew our future and okay. families would have ample time okay. to make decisions if they had to. Okay, because that, that was what I was thinking it was when it was, and that's what it said here, and yet you're here nice and early with all kinds of information, and, and that's great. Um, I, I want to, one of the things I want to say, and, and the charter school um, movement, as you've said, is about innovation and it's about differentiation and it's about making sure that kids can succeed. And um, I, I just, n now we see five people sitting at this table. It used to be one, sometimes two. And, and the things that you have brought forward, um, you know, whatever your particular role is, um, I think are really indicative of the spirit of why charter schools are available to our students. And I can't agree more with you when you talk about not only in TOSA but everywhere else, people are shopping. They are shopping around for education for their kids. 
Um, and I know, I know how much it takes to, to create partnerships, whether it's within your own building, you know, with two schools in one building, um, whether it's working toward the grants, um, whatever it is. So I guess I just want to say I'm extremely impressed with the way that the people that who, who believe in the concept, believe in the kids, um, have come together for a common goal. And I just want to say real one quick little thing about grants. With that being in that old building, there are some grants <laughs> out there. I work at the Historical Society. There are some grants out there for um, maintaining and using um, historic buildings. So, you know, I can give you a hand with that at some point if you like. Are there some that help us create wireless environments in those <laughs> wonderful Not through the Historical Society, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I may have questions as other board members speak, but um, I just wanted to start out that way. This is exciting, and you know we all know public education is in trouble in some ways, um, and so that anything that we can do um, to improve things for kids and to invite people here um, is positive and exciting. Mrs. Weber. I'd like to put in a plug for the community of Wauwatosa. I truly believe we are blessed to live in this community. Our families believe in education, and they're willing to work hard to get the success that we, I have to use the word demand, um, not willing to give in easily. We're going to look for the best and always looking for ways that we can have success, and you've mentioned that a number of times. It's exciting to see the growth that's coming. Uh, there's so many positives with this, and it's I believe it's because of the community that we live in, and it gives you the fertile land to grow in. So keep up the excellent work. I could comment on, on what you, you might say. Um, I, just, I just want to tell you that um, my parents chose Wauwatosa School District um, over 40 years ago because of, of the strong strength of the district, um, mainly because of the K-4 program, but um, because of that. And I, and I love hearing you say that, and it's one of the reasons I stayed. My husband and I both grew up in it. And so it's, yeah, I totally agree with you. It's all about the, the parents. Um, we, we, we kind of run the school. I mean, we're all volunteers here. <laughs> but we love our kids. And uh, I, it, it's great to see that. It's fun to look back. Um, we were an early community with four-year kindergarten. And why are you doing that? Children don't belong in school yet. And it's good. It continues to be we set examples. And we, we believe in what we're doing, and we forge ahead. And I have to say it, and thank you, God, it's all, with success. Just one more comment. When um, we were kind of deciding the, the course of the school, and um, we had opened up the discussion to the community. And I remember being at that meeting, and there were 60 community members who came to um, talk about the charter and, and the direction of the charter. And um, that, that's exciting. And I think that's been a trend in, in Wauwatosa ever since I've been here. It's a, it's a great place to raise a family. And how many times second and third generation come back to live here? <laughs> Mr. Carter? Thank you. Uh, I want to compliment you for getting involved. And uh, you don't know it, but your faces show continued enthusiasm throughout the entire talk. Um, so it's really quite evident that you're believing in what you're doing and quite excited about it. Um, I have a few questions. And one is about some things in your bylaws. Not because it's my business to change them or do anything about them, but I want to just see if I understand, understand them. You say in it that you're, you have an executive committee with four members and that they're going to make decisions on behalf of the board. And I guess one thing I haven't quite understood really well is, is as a charter school and an instrumentality of the district, is your governing council also required to follow the open meetings laws as we are? Okay, so 
One thing I noticed when I read the number of people that you have on your governing council right now, there are eight members. So four members is half the board, and they technically shouldn't be meeting if it's a half or more of the members of the board. So what I would like, and I don't have to sort it all out right now, is maybe have some discussions with the district as to what the responsibilities are versus the open meetings laws so they're all operating on the right level. We are currently actually in the process of adding two additional council members, which we've put us at 10. And so it will be increasing that, so we'll have to, I guess, take that into consideration as we move forward. And one other thing that I saw, and I just want to make sure this is what you intended, were you talking about quorum and voting when you have a general meeting of members? You said that a quorum is 10 percent of the families in the district, okay, and a majority of a quorum can make a decision. So if there are 60 families and six families show up, that's a quorum. If four of those families vote to do something, then the decision would stand. Is that what you intended, that four families can drive a decision for the school? The, well, actually, the initial, um, that, that is only for voting in op the officers of the organization. The officers actually are the people who would vote. The board is the one who votes. Um, so in, in electing those from the count to the council, in electing that, we have to have six people gotcha. available to vote. So that's just to make sure that uh, the gentleman who helped us with this actually helps. He, he uh, works in Fluid, po Fluid Power Association development and um, has written a number of bylaws. He actually enjoys reading the bylaws. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had said, you really want to make that a realistic number so that when you hold elections, people can be elected. Um, otherwise, it's, it's near impossible to get things done because you never elect a board. So that was actually only for the election of officers or uh, of council members, election to the council. Um, that was the intent. Okay. And, then the co and then the council members would have voting rights or not. I don't have a voting right. Um, and then they would decide from there to, you know, vote up or down on the initiatives. Okay, good. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, my other main question, I think, is about your budget going forward, okay? Now, I, ha I had asked if before the meeting if you had a five-year plan, budget plan, and that you, you really don't at this point. And the reason I'm concerned about that is the district is picking up the majority of the costs for the school, say 98 percent or so, teachers, benefits, administrator costs, space, building budget, and all that. And, and you need to, you know, go beyond that. And your school has extra technology associated with it. Like initially you bought computers for all the students. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is that something you're planning on continuing doing with all the students as you grow? Mm -hmm. So as you... It's coming up on time to replace computers, and as the school grows, you're going to need new computers and whatever else you need to buy for the STEM program. How am I going to say this? You're asking us to have sign a new five-year contract, but we don't know what your expectation is of how much money you need to raise to fulfill those technology needs. <laughs> have an idea of what that's going to cost? We anticipated those costs. Right now the district contributes 12500 roughly. Uh, we figured those costs to be about 30000 So if you less the twelve five, it's about $17,500. And that would be for us to get onto a cycle of replacement for the computers that would be one multi-age classroom per year for three years at a cost of about $10,000. Um, this year we don't have that in, in our plan. That's why our budget is about $8,000 to operate is what we're hoping for, uh, to be able to fundraise for. And in the future, uh, what we're hoping, now that we actually have a number, uh, because it was very hard for a while to figure out, I mean, that's a very big question, you know, where are we going to be in five years? Um, if you had told me four or five years ago we'd be walking around with thin little tablet devices that were computers, I would have thought, well, I wouldn't have thought you were crazy, but I would have thought, well, that's pretty. It's going to be pretty cool. So now that technology is evolving and pricing is evolving, um, we've been able to nail down a number. We figure about $400 per unit. We can now start to ask uh, small businesses in the area, would you be willing to sponsor a class, five kids, sponsor a week worth of cost. We, we're developing, as it says in our uh, one of the documents that, that I presented to you, 
in the, the ream of paper, the financial plan document that we're really trying to um, reach out in small gains to small businesses around the area and get them to contribute. We actually have just recently discovered actually that there's a lot of companies that will match funds. So if you work for a certain company, Quad Graphics, for example, um, they may have a matching program for you that if you contribute, they contribute. So we're hoping we can tap in now and explicitly, specifically ask those individuals to help contribute. We've had a number of grandparents who have said, um, hey, I'd love to contribute. How can I help? And now we can start to give them some of those sponsorship numbers. And so our spring is going to be spent much in effort uh, trying to develop ways to outreach for those those kinds of contributions. And then we're hoping, like I said, to continually write grants to try and cover it in one swoop. And then we can just start to build our bank account a little bit and have some savings and investment potential. But we're not quite there. And so the, the, I know, I'm confident, I sit here before you and tell you that we have some financial work to do over the next five years. And, and some of that is forecasting and planning. Um, and that definitely will be done um, well, probably by the next time we would have a three-year review if we had that available to us because I think we're in a good place now where we can start making some of those uh, financial decisions. One of the, just one of the comments on regarding technology, and I think we focus a lot on the fact that they had one-to-one -one computing, and that was the grant funds, but Mike made reference to it a little bit. Where we're going with technology in the district, I don't see one-to-one -one computing. I mean, they're still our students, so in reference to whatever students at any other elementary school are going to be getting, whether we move to tablets or it's some other type of device, I think eventually we're going to be moving away from the concept of devices anyway. And it's really going to be access to the cloud. And where our, our resources are going to be um, invested is making sure we have access. Most kids, maybe not all the elementary kids, have some sort of, I mean, a phone, some kind of smartphone, some kind of access, laptops at home that they use. And those that don't, we bridge that gap as a school district. But as we move further down the path, that students, parents have access to that cloud, whether it's in the classroom, it's outside the classroom. So I think a key point is five years down the road, it's going to be a completely different world in regards to technology. And I, I, we're, we're already moving in that direction. Um, and that's, I think it's hard to really try to envision what technology is going to be. And, in five years from now, but I know there's a component that fits, those students fit within the same realm as all the other students for elementary, except they're looking at this point in the, in the vision, it's going to be somewhat more expensive than the traditional student right now, but I anticipate that changing. Well, I mean, I know that you can't say this is exactly the technology we're going to use in year four, but I guess my point was that by extending the contract, you know, we'll be saying we're going to commit 200 to $300,000 a year to your school to keep you open because you think you're doing a good job, but you don't have a clear plan or an idea of what you need to spend above that and how you're going to raise that money. So I'm glad to hear that you're putting work into those ideas and, and working on that. So that, that was just a concern that I had. So I just wanted to make a comment to that as well. Um, uh, because we were um, exploring kind of how the charter was going to be built, um, um, I, I, for one, and, and a lot of the other board members, have, as, as well as um, Mr. Leach, have sat down with the teachers and really worked on what do you want to bring into the classroom. And so as we're finding out what we want to bring in the classroom, like we just brought in Singapore math. So now we know what we need to spend on that. So now we know how to create a budget with that. There's different computer programs that the teachers want. Well, there's a, you know, there's a yearly cost for that, you know, like a subscription cost. And so as we know what the, te the teachers are trying stuff, then they're, you know, keeping this, not keeping that. And as we know what the teachers want to keep, we're, we're really starting to build a budget from that. So we have a lot of items that we know are in that budget. That's kind of where that $8,000 is still kind of hanging out there. We're, we're working on in and out. Um, but we would like to, as we apply for grant money, say we're not just applying for capital. We're applying for uh, we want to support this computer program or we want this to go to Singapore Math. So we, were, we are working on that, and we hope to have that all written out as soon as possible. Yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Thanks. Um, yep. The last comment I have is about measuring student achievement. And you've given me the opportunity to beat my drum about the WKCE scores again. So because you are a nimble organization, I'm going to encourage you to think about student achievement differently. My fault with the WKCE is exactly what you said, Mr. Leach. Oh, it's 100%. We don't, what else is there to do? 
That's a common misperception when you present the WKCE scores as proficient plus advanced. So I'm going to encourage you to think about it differently and to try to find more rigorous standards. Maybe just only measure advanced. When you get to 100% advanced, then you know you've done something. But I think what, with no child left behind, it's been shown that district states have gradually lowered their standards to meet federal standards. The proficiency has really been defined down. So when we say our students are 100% proficiency in advance, the national testing hasn't shown that to be true. So as I said, being a nimble organization and being able to make changes quickly, I would encourage you to think of more rigorous uh, achievement standards for your students so you really can push them higher than we currently do. But I think I admire what you're doing. I'm glad that you're involved. I, th I hope that you find and you may have found being in the chair making the decisions a little different than sitting on the sideline. <laughs> and uh, good luck. Other board member questions or comments? Mr. Meyer? Um, I'm just so very impressed with what you've done. Uh, I was frankly skeptical in the early years and it seems that this evolution you've gone through, this discovery of what you want to do has um, established in my thinking I mean, what do I, you know, what does it care what I, we wouldn't care what I think, but you know that, that there's a, a definite credibility about what you're doing. That, you know, in the early years it was apparent you were experimenting or searching, and um, it seems now more certain that you know what your learning mission is for the kids. So that that's pretty cool, and if you any of you figure out where to find this money, would you come to another meeting here at the mothership and help us I was just gonna say we're gonna find help find you. money too? Because you, yes, please, um, yeah. because we're going to be looking to find some part. right. Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you, Randall. Um, you do use maps, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, hopefully that would. Give some additional information, Mr. Croner, you know, because we are looking for continuous improvement. But um, interestingly, we uh, the booklet or the principles and standards of the um, National Charter School Association. We added some references to that in our board policy last year with regard to charter schools, and they have an eight-page appendix for 2010, and I think it's from page. Four on down, where they talk about measuring, measuring and um, testing, and it's it's really interesting, and it's also very educational in that it talks about the difficulties in doing that. But um, I can send any one of you a link to that, and um, so uh, I think it does speak to that. Which is also part of the board policy that it suggests that you review that document and use right. it as well. So right. Um, yeah, that's something that we're kind of continuously looking at is um, looking at um, revising a report card for our school. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're going to seriously look at next year. That um, a report card that really truly reflects, you know, what it is that we're doing and what we're assessing our children on. And, and I think we always um, have kind of been ahead in the back of our mind, you know, ways to assess children. And, and that's something that we, we, we do need to look at and, and how can we... Um, you know, like measure these kids. Um, the SKers that are currently in the first year, SK in the charter, you know, how can we effectively track them through this program? They'll be the first children who go all six years through the program. And we have these fourth graders coming up, and they'll be the first group of kids. There's about 10 of them that have um, gone through the charter program for five years. So definitely I think there, there are other ways and other avenues that we can look at in regards to assessment. Yeah. And, and like I said, this is really interesting. But overall, when I look at the, um, the requirements of us as responsible authorizers and your report tonight, it's, it's very exciting. The first um, topic is the quality educational program, which you've described to us, solid business plan. And it even says evidence of anticipated fundraising contributions. So, you know, that you're telling us that this is what you're working on. Um, especially when you read number three on page three of this, 
um, effective governments and management structures and systems and all the changes that you've made in those areas and, and so many of them are spelled out here as things that responsible authorizers should be looking for. So um, it, it's it's very encouraging. So. Mr. Ray? Thanks. I also want to comment on the level of enthusiasm and the level of energy that's coming from out here because it is very noticeable and I, I greatly appreciate that. A um, couple questions for you about um, one building and two schools, and I'm just kind of, kind of want to get an update about uh, what is happening in the environment there. When there was some initial information uh, conveyed about the anticipated growth of the charter school, I think there was a lot of tension that was coming out of that, and I, I'm guessing that that information has become more commonly known at this point in time, but I don't know that for sure, so I'd be interested in hearing about that. Um, and I'd also be interested in hearing about some of the other things that maybe have been happening as a dialogue, uh, communication, to sort of address some of those issues of tension and, uh, and help everybody have a common vision for the building as opposed to having two separate visions for the building. Can, can you just kind of share some information on those issues? Well, that's a really simple answer. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to say that Initially, when I when I went to the building, I, I, I knew very clearly from community input and things where we were. Um, staff, I think part of the reason why things have been productive is that staff has been very willing to put out there, hey, you know what, this is a question or concern we have. Um, some of those things are questions or concerns that are valid, and some of those things are questions and concerns that are just based in fear or uncertainty. Um, and that's always hard to deal with. But what we've done since, well, what I've tried to do since day one there as the building principal is to say, I'll give you what I know. Um, unfortunately, it's about as good as, you know, as yesterday's news. I mean, I can give you the information in real time. Um, I can't make any any promises to say this is the, the teacher that may be moving or this is the grade level that may be shifting. or the. But, but together, the staff has agreed that... Um, we just have to move forward and try to accomplish, you know, our building goal, which is 95% proficiency or, or advanced on WKC, 80%, you know, the big four for the school district that you're familiar with. Um, and so we had some conversations about, you know, um, what basically a lot of conversations happened about what the charter is, what regular Wilson is, what we stand for. And in the end, it came out as we all are in this profession because we love working with kids and we want to see students successful. Um, and so we came up with an overarching building-wide building, building mission of we want to provide ex extraordinary um, learning experiences for all students so that they're socially, emotionally balanced and able to achieve their highest potential. Um, the idea is that every kid who's in that building, regardless of school, come out in the end raring to go to sixth grade at Longfellow or Whitman and, and ready to be successful. And... Um, the, the parents have been excellent in give, giving me the history, yet also respecting the fact that we have to change some things because we can't be what we were. Um, some of those things happened and they were wonderful in, in the past history of Wilson. They need to be respected and celebrated, but we make our own traditions to some extent. We make new traditions. And so we've come up with some ideas for like the beehive, for example, that happened, you know, to us from the state of Wisconsin saying you need to make sure you track behavioral data, and we've had fun with it. And sta that's all staff. That is all teachers. Uh, if they don't buy into PBIS, it doesn't work. Um, and so they have bought into that. And they've also, the collaboration is, is, is currency. It's common language for teachers. And so they want to talk about what worked really well. And you should see the energy. It's not just charter energy. This is energy in the beehive, let me warn you. Um, it, it's really just a positive energy in the building of, hey, I tried this with my kids, and we set a goal as a PLC team, and it worked. And then we share that success across the building, either school. Um, and in the end, our eyes are on the prize of we want the students to be successful and achieve them to the best of their potential. So we've had, we had, you know, we had a couple of tough conversations, um, but... Initially, I think just getting through that, and, and I think it came down to people just not understanding um, the benefit of having a charter in the building. They knew the barriers for sure, 
humans tend to know that pretty easily, but the benefits were, were really out, outweighing the, the barriers in the end. Um, we'll continue, like I said, to, to try and work with the culture and uh, parents and the, the kids get it. It's, it's hilarious to see the kids in, in our environment. Um, they just bring such an energy and love for learning, uh, both Charter and Wilson, that that's been a great common currency too, is that you have a kid that goes to school here, cool. doesn't matter which school they go to, they're going to have a fun time um, in the building. And so that's kind of been a way for us to go at this. I wish I could nail it down and tell you I did this, then I did this, and we did that, and we did this. Um, but it's only because people were ready to have those conversations. Uh, Mrs. Keats opened up a lot of those doors last year in, in hearing some of the things around the building expansion plan. And a lot of those conversations were there, and then I just stepped in and got to kind of process and take it in and try and work with it a little bit. And we are not there yet. I mean, we will get even better with every year. There is uncertainty around the building plan. You know, obviously teachers, it's, it's people, it's relationships, it's jobs. Not in the sense that jobs might go away and people are out of work, but that they'll leave this community that they're building, they're working so hard to build. What's been really neat is teachers that are saying, you know that STEM thing, let me learn about that a little bit. I could always be a better science teacher, regardless of whatever building I'm in. So if you do some professional development in STEM, can I be a part of that? Those are the kind of positive steps forward we've taken as a collective group, and I'm hoping we can continue to tiptoe forward that way. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't put in my two cents. I think um, the PBIC, S, ugh, too many acronyms, um, really, you know, we, we're, we're in a school, we're in a school setting, we know kind of the expected behavior, but to really have that expected behavior of all children clearly stated has made a, a tremendous difference across both schools because now we are really functioning as two schools, one building. Um, I think in, you know, a lot of what happened in the past with the, the culture was kind of, it was new, it, they were bumps that had happened when you're transitioning and going through change. People are like, okay, a charter's here. What, what exactly is a charter? And oh, now you guys want to expand? And oh, now what? And I think, you know, it was just like, it was constantly moving. We were kind of surviving and trying to figure out who we are. And at the same time, you know, trying to learn how, how we fit, you know, in, in the Wauwatosa district in, in that building. And, um, I, you know, I think that we just kind of had to go through that. And with um, more of a vision for us and who we are and more of a vision that, you know, th you know we're staying here in this building, I think that there have actually been some situations where there haven't been conversations and they're just people in both schools stepping up saying, you know what, we're going to move forward together. And um, one of the really exciting things is um, parents from both schools, we are planning our first annual spring fling um, April 16th at Hart Park. It's um, a joint community from TSHST and Wilson. We are having the five card studs come and play. And um, lots of exciting auction um, items and baskets that we'll be raffling I off. I did. It's open up to the whole community. And um, any um, monies raised from that will benefit both schools. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to speak to is um, if we as a charter school are really being a living laboratory and, and testing, you know, kind of the best practices, actually the, the first place that that's going to be seen in the district is, is Wilson because we are really looking at um, mutually beneficial relationships that would affect everybody in the building. Another comment, I guess, that I wanted to uh, touch on is that um, while we've been talking tonight, I've gone back and I've looked at the three-year review that you gave us in um, July. And uh, there was some information contained in the three-year review uh, with respect to MAP test scores in particular that I, I'm hoping that you'll continue to report on. I'm noticing in one of in the, the handout tonight, there's an area that was addressed in your July of 2010 report that's not included in that information. Mm -hmm. And I, I would personally like to see a continuity of information to be reported on the past continue to 
report on it uh, at, at the present because mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be helpful just to, to keep just to, to, to see what progress is being made in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, then the final comment that I wanted to make, this is directed to the other board members. Um, we have seen in the packet of information that we're looking at tonight uh, a proposed contract that's going to come back to us at some point in time. I guess I don't know exactly when. Um, but I, I, number one, I'd like to know the logistics about what do we have to take any action with respect to that? Uh, do we have to formally vote on approving it, I guess, is the ultimate question. And if so, do we want somebody from a legal perspective, an attorney, to take a look at all of that documentation and then provide the board slash the district with any input or advice or commentary before we would take that formal action? I actually had a question as to who drafted this as well. And so that was, that's, I think, part of your answer hinges on who drafted this. Uh, and uh, certainly if it was not someone on behalf of the district, I would think that would be appropriate to have it reviewed. It was drafted by Mr. Shannon um, on behalf of the district, but I don't think it's out of the realm of uh, to have it looked over or, or gone through by another um, we, we did use, and I'm trying to think of his name. Mike Ostermeyer. Mike Ostermeyer previously, and we can certainly have him go over it. I think a lot of the language is very similar to what uh, Mike Ostermeyer did put together. So I think the review for him would be relatively easy to do. Yeah, and even from, from our perspective, like, for example, has the law changed at all between the last time we did this and now, and would it be a good idea just to have that... Uh, somebody who's got the real expertise in that area take a look at it, someone from outside of the district. <coughs> I'm assuming we're just we're talking about the contract. Yes. Yes. Okay. Board members have any other comment on Mr. Ray's um, the issue raised by Mr. Ray? I fully anticipate that that will happen prior to this coming back for a vote. Did you have any other questions? Nope, that's it. Any other board member questions, Mr. Smithfield? Um Then when do you expect this to come back before the board? As soon as possible after the review review by Mr. Ostermeyer. Okay. Um, I see the organization as being uh, providing a lot more detail than when we first started on this road. And congratulations to you for for putting so much effort and work into it. Um, I do uh, very much like WSTEM and the direction you're going there. I have a question on the health aspect of it. Will it just continue as you're currently you know, teaching in your curriculum, or will it just go away with the engineering component coming on? It, it certainly will not uh, <clears throat> go away. In fact, what we've, we found is that we're doing more than just the, the health science approach. So it would only be enhanced by any of the engineering connections that we made through physics study. And right now, the body as a, as a machine is the big focus. Um, engineering, machines, good connection there. And so I anticipate, and our teachers anticipate, and are very excited about the idea of continually adding the engineering pieces to it. Um, we would, it's just that I think when we thought about it, because we did more than just health science, logically we should add in the other components as well. So it's just sciences in general. Um, not necessarily with a focus. I saw in our initial contract there was something about diagnostics of internal medication, medicine, and uh, cool. Well, uh, we haven't done that, but but anticipated at the time when we wrote the contract that was how it was written. So we've evolved from that point, but certainly not um, taking that out of the current practice. Okay. And then the financial piece of it is that the district would provide similar levels of funding as we currently are for all other students. For, right, yep. for all the students. I mean, currently what we're doing now, and if the levels of students increase, obviously right. we're going to be providing those services. Um, I would like to see, actually, um, um, a proposed, fi I know that it won't be uh, very specific in some areas that you would like it to be, but I would like to see over time projecting your growth, what does that look like over the contract period? And I'm not sure if Mr. Croner's question was similar 
But I would like to see that. Financial undertaking? Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything further? And I don't have anything further right now. I, I just, I really did think your presentation was very um, complete and well thought out um, and was happy to see that. Just a, one comment about the legal review. Um, I was a little uncomfortable when we had it reviewed last time. Mr. Ostermeyer seemed like he was an advocate for the charter school. And this isn't a, like, picking sides issue, but it's a contract. And I don't, I don't even know, I don't know what the right answer is to this question as to how to make sure typically one attorney doesn't review both sides of a contract. Um, that's kind of the situation that we're in. But I don't know how to set up a situation so we get an opinion that's looking, looking out for the interests of the board and an opinion that's looking out for the interests of the charter school. Because there are places in the contract where, you know, can tip one way or the other. And I'm not trying to make an ad, adversarial situation, but a, in a contractual situation, I wasn't really comfortable with the way it was reviewed legally last time. But I don't, I don't know if there's any other way around that. Well, I think certainly Mr. Channon reviewed it from the board's perspective. And I think one of the changes that he um, put in there was advantageous to the board, the school board more so than, than the charter school. But I mean, it's certainly nothing intended to be disadvantageous as well. But Mr. Ostermeyer, if hired by the school district, by the board, would be representing the board's interest in the development or the review of that contract, clearly. All right. Thank you. Anything further? I would just like to commend you on the amount of work that you've done over the past year. I have to say, to be honest, after the, evalu the, the review in July, I had grave concerns about whether this school was really viable in the long run. And I think you've made great strides to reassuring us that it is possible to continue. So um, I just want to say you put in a lot of work, and it's quite obvious, and we do appreciate that. I, mean, I, do, I appreciate that anyway. And I uh, have a much greater confidence uh, in how the school can proceed in the future. So thank you very much to you, and I'm sure that there are many others who have put in a lot of work over the past year. Is there any community comment on this item? All right. Thank you all can very I, much. I just want to make... Oh, oh. oh I'm sorry. Yes, please. Could you please state your name and address? Dana McCormick, uh, 1734 North 69th. And I just want to thank the board and, and these people for making the school possible. Um, we were on the fence about attending public schools and having this option that's very flexible and responsive because it's small enough to be that way um, persuaded us to go with the public schools. So you want yourselves four more kids. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, and I guess the, the timing of that comment is, is what I, can, I want to talk a little bit about, or just the, the landscape of charter schools is changing dramatically in Wisconsin. And the, there's legislation out that's going to change it to a statewide authorizing board. And the reason for that is because of instrumentalities of school district charter schools. And I think what we have here has been a success, and it's been a painful success. But it's a success, and it flies in the face of the reasons that people are saying we need a statewide, statewide authorizer because there's been so many problems with instrumentalities. And I think this is one example of, of a positive change. But I think it also speaks, it was mentioned earlier, about choice and the oppor opportunity for choice for parents to have those choices. I think um, as of yesterday we're, or Friday, we're somewhere around the neighbor, in the neighborhood of 70 applications for the Montessori school already and the number of applications for this. I just think people are looking for those options, and schools are changing. And if we don't do it, somebody else is going to provide those options. And I think we can, we can do it better as a school district. So my thanks goes out to all of you, too. Thank you very much. We have one other item under the <coughs> superintendent's report. Dr. Erdl will review budget scenarios for the 2011-12 school year. Well, this. When this item was put on the agenda uh, last week, we know that things have occurred that have created a lot more uncertainty than we are already under in dealing with the budget. What I'm going to try to do is just talk a little bit about uh, where we think we're at. Um, and I mean, I've had a lot of discussions over the past four days with other superintendents, business managers, uh, legislators, in trying to figure out where we're at as a school district. and. While I could throw out a lot of different scenarios related to rumors and information that's on, on, the, on the news and a lot of uh, anxiety around where the budget's going to be at, 
I think we can go anywhere from a deficit of $5.5 million upward to um, or, or lower down to an even budget. And we're just not real sure from open enrollment revenue to levy, um, possible levy increases or not being able to have levy increases to the Wisconsin retirement system, which just that 5.8% for our district is about $2.3 million so that would uh, basically be shorted on eight or go back, back directly to the state for our entire district. Um, some of the health insurance pieces that are being tossed, um, not tossed, they're being proposed. Um, but I think to try to respond at this point before things are passed, before it works through, I think we're just, it's kind of a fruitless effort. But I also think that it's important to look at process and where we're going to be going from here. We believe, uh, Mr. Mack and I even went through some scenarios this morning, and that's where I come up with the 5.3 or $5.5 million in trying to put all different kinds of numbers in, that different things that we've heard or that are possibilities. But we know on next Tuesday, the 22nd, when the state budget comes out, we'll be able to get some better ideas of where we're going to be sitting. Um, I think there's going to be a need for the school board to meet outside of just the regular meetings uh, in the next couple of weeks and certainly in the next month to have some discussions, in-depth discussions about where we're going to go and um, the fact that we'll be bringing some recommendations at some point. I'm going to want to be out in the schools meeting with staff, sharing information, discussing where we're going. But I think the key driver for our budget has already been set. And when Mr. Leach kind of jokingly said the big four, um, we do have our school district goals. We have our district mission that's up on the wall. We have our district focus. Um, we have our long-range plan. We have our district development plan. Those were all developed in collaboration. And really, instead of looking at the deficit model of what are we going to cut, it's what's our values, what's most important. And that's really what, what we need to use to drive and certainly will drive my recommendations to the school board for any reductions that we do have to make. But I've always been of the belief of let's not throw a number out there and the, the projections, I know some school districts come up with eight-year projections for budgets so five years, five-year projections and projections on enrollment and we've seen those get blown out of the water at different times and I just think as long as we're prepared, we're, um, we're flexible and able to respond accordingly. It's going to be, this is going to be the biggest challenge financially maybe that uh, our school district has faced certainly in a long time and I also believe and, and know that September 1st next year, the doors are going to swing open and we're going to have 7,300 kids, hopefully more, coming in our doors and they don't really care what, the budget, what happened to the budget and they don't really care what we're dealing with. They expect the best and our parents expect the best and that's really kind of how I, I look at the whole concept of the budget reductions. We're going to have to do more with less, there's absolutely no doubt about it and we can, we'll continue to advocate. Um, for what we can, but we certainly know in our, in our state we're in a, we're in a tough place. Um, we're facing some tough legislation right now, and we, we have to wait and see how that all plays out. But um, as soon as we get that information, certainly at the next board meeting, there'll be more extensive discussion. But I also um, will we'll need to have a lot more discussions before we make any come to any conclusions on, on reductions for this next school year, the 11-12 school year. Board members, any questions or comments? Mr. Ray? Uh, Dr. Arnold, I don't know if you can share any information uh, along the, some timing lines and some issues that are happen happening or potentially going to happen legislatively. But I was trying to sort out, and this was based on listening to something I was hearing on the radio today. Um, it sounds like that there are there maybe are some things that are going to happen, especially in terms of that would impact uh, state or governmental employees that might be happening through legislative activities that aren't necessarily connected to the budget process. Is that what you're hearing as well? And so are there sort of even two different timing tracks that we need to follow? I think um, there's more than two. I think the, the budget repair bill, which is what we're dealing with right now, I think the piece that by uh, as of April 1st, the WRS contribution would be start being deducted and um, would be either sent to the state or we'd have that reduction in aid. And I think the governor tries to explain it as though he, the, the budget repair bill is giving school boards and local municipalities 
the flexibility to deal with what's coming next Tuesday for the um, for the regular budget. So yeah, there is two. I mean, I, I think he intends to have that passed this week and, and signed into law the budget repair bill, and then uh, certainly before he announces his budget on the 22nd, and then the. I think the theory is that the tools will be in place to deal with those deficits. Any other, Mr. Croner? I, I'm still not clear on exactly what the district is doing now. I mean, whether or not we know what's going to be proposed on the 22nd, you've already stated that we could have an even budget or maybe minus $5 million. So to me, it, it would make sense to work through some scenarios. If we have to cut a million dollars, we're going to move in this direction. If we have to cut... 2.5, we're going to move in this direction. If we have to cut five, we're going to move in this direction. So, in a preliminary sense, are you have already started moving along those lines? I mean, if if called the task, I, I could lay out five million dollars worth of cuts right here for you. Um, but it's not just me. There's a lot of discussions that need to take place, and, and looking at um, all the priorities, working with the, the directors, working with the other administrators. Um, I mean. To say we've been consumed with this over the past several months, and to say Mr. Max certainly has been consumed with it since October, yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of administrative work that go has gone into really looking at um, what are the possibilities. And it, he's constantly updating his um, budget package. And but I, I think I also think there's more uncertainty now than there ever has been. I mean. Mr. Mack can probably respond to that, but certainly in, I know in the past 10 years right now, even going into this point, the level of uncertainty of what dollars are going to go where and our ability to raise revenues is is out there. But as far as developing, I mean, I can, uh, I can tell you exactly $1.7 million at all district pay freeze. We save $1.7 million. We increase FTE at the secondary schools by one FTE. That's a savings of $520,000. We double that to two FTEs, we're talking $1.1 million. Um, so, yeah, we know what things cost, and we know how we can recommend changes and how we can work through that. Um, so there, there's, a, and there's a lot of different components to our school district that uh, we have to consider before we bring recommendations. One thing that I, I would like to urge, at least this particular year, because of the budget situation, is that the board be involved earlier than usual in the budget deliberations. I mean, in the past, we've gotten a budget and had to make a decision within two weeks. And I think considering what might have to happen, I would like there to be more open discussion of what decisions are open to us and, and how the board is going to come about deciding. In other words, not just receiving a final recommendation and voting on it, but being presented with a series of recommendations and letting the board set priorities and and have time to make a real decision along with the community input so that we can make a informed decision with the community. In, well, in I, I think that process starts in two days on Wednesday in the in-service. It's listed as a topic for discussion for the Good. board. Thanks. Mr. Meyer? I think in the next, the next couple of weeks, you know, there are the things that affect the whole state pretty much the same way. And Wauwatosa of course, has to be part of the solution and work with the government from Madison with what they deal to us. But the thing where I see our, um, you know, I know our, our efforts, the efforts by our Assemblyman Dale Kuyenga, do I have, you know, I, I don't want to mess up anyone's name. I, I know he's been communicating with us. Um, he's been very interested in hearing how these things affect Wauwatosa. And where I'm going is this aid formula concept or the choices there that Mr. Mack laid out for us that um, I think you have to stay in close communication with um, our representatives, at, you know, Leah Bukmir as well, to, to, and I'm sure they want to know, you know, how does, you know, there's a lot of technical issues in how the aid formula affects individual school districts and I'm sure they want to hear from us on on you know how things impact us the the things that affect everyone the same way like a, a cap on retirement benefits or a, a copay on health insurance that's statewide well everybody will have to deal with that but that aid formula thing 
if it affects us, you know, where John Mack would say in some things there's winners and there's losers, our, our representatives need to know if Wauwatosa is going to be a loser in the whole mix, that um, perhaps they'll be able to weigh in for us. Anyone else? Is there any community comment on this agenda item? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Erdogan. We will be discussing this during our in-service this week. That is the uh, last item on our agenda. Other than public comment on non-agenda items, there is one final opportunity. If anyone has a comment on an item not on tonight's agenda, please approach the microphone. Seeing none, following this regular meeting, the school board will adjourn into executive session pursuant to WISTAT sections 19.85 sub 1 sub F to review the early retirement requests of current staff members and to provide the board with updates regarding specific personnel problems, where such discussions will include consideration of financial, medical, social, or personal histories, disciplinary data of specific persons, or preliminary considerations of specific personnel problems, which if discussed in public would likely have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data. Is there a motion to adjourn into executive session? So moved. <laughs> well, Mr. Ray, I heard him first. <laughs> is, is, yeah, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Croner. Uh, Mrs. Galante, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Milfeld? Yes. Mrs. Randall? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Mrs. Weber? Yes. Mrs. Fee? Yes. We'll take an approximately five-minute break and reconvene into executive session.